All right. Um, good afternoon and welcome to Blood on the Street 2. Uh, it's not a foregone conclusion that there's blood on the street or it's going to be the case, but let's, let's talk to our panel. Uh, uh, that's ja their job to figure it out. Um, uh, so we've got uh, f four of us on the, five of you on the panel. Um, uh, Jason, let's go to uh, full screen mode. I think somehow it's stuck. Jason is a colleague of mine. I'm just talking to him. Hi, Shams. We are streaming in full screen mode right now. Okay, right. Uh, uh, so, uh, so let me let me introduce you to uh, you to the panel. And as I do so, I'll also uh, uh, talk about why we are doing this. Like I said, uh, whether there's blood on the street is not a foregone conclusion. Um, uh, and and we did a. A webinar a couple of months ago on a similar theme when when the outlook was uh, very much foggier than it is today and then many people will still argue that it continues to be difficult climate in which to make forecasts so so uh, so we are appreciative of the brave souls that have come here uh, and these guys all make a living forecasting so thank you guys and thank you for being so brave as to you know put yourself forward to make public forecasts um, um, uh, and if I introduce you to the panel, I think many of you will uh, already uh, know them. Um, they are all from the sell side of the market, right? And I'll, uh, when, as we get started, I'll ask one of you to define what the sell side versus the buy side of the market is. So we were very particular that we wanted those from the sell side. Uh, a couple of them are actually representing both sides. I think with uh, Dimantha and uh, Udishan are both sell and buy. Udishan are both sell and buy. Um, um, uh, and uh, uh, first on there on the screen, uh, Dimanth, you can give us a wave. Is Dimanth Matthew from uh, uh, First Capital? Um, First Capital is is, is, a, is both uh, it's an investment bank. It's it's a large bond trading house. Uh, it's a primary dealer and uh, also a stock brokerage. Uh, and next up, uh, can I introduce uh, Lakshini? Lakshini is from Asia Securities. Hi, um, uh, one of uh, the largest brokerages, uh, stock brokerages in Sri Lanka. Uh, up next is Nikita from Bartlett Religare. Um, Nikita is a veteran there, uh, and um, uh, and again Nikita heads research. Um, uh, uh, can I introduce you to Sanjeev Fernando from CTCLSA, uh, part of uh, Ceylon Theatres? Thanks, Sanjeev, and um, uh, I hope you can see Udishan. Uh, auditions from Capital Alliance or Cal, I think, as you call yourselves right now, uh, audition. Uh, again, just like uh, First Capital, uh, it is a it's an investment bank. It's uh, sig got a significant bond business, uh, primary dealership, bond trading, uh, and also um, and also stock brokerage. Right. Uh, in terms of the format uh, for today, um, I will ask each of these panelists to make. Um, take two minutes or three minutes to make some initial uh, comments. Um, what we're going to talk about is the outlook for the economy. Uh, we're going to talk about asset classes. That's three asset classes, right? We're going to talk about uh, stocks, bonds, and maybe real estate if anybody here feels bold enough to tread those waters. Uh, none of you are here because necessarily of your real estate expertise. You're certainly, uh, you're all here because of your macro and equity expertise. Um, and um, we want to talk about the future clearly. So about the outlook, right? Uh, but uh, I'll ask somebody to tell me what this buy and sell side is. You're all sell side. Um, can I put Nikita on the spot? Uh, what is buy and sell uh, in a capital market point of view? So when you're in the sell side, I believe you sell investment ideas. The buy side is the side with money uh, who, who would buy ideas. I think that's the simplest way to put it. All right. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Nikita, for that. So all of you are representing the sales side um, uh, and a couple of you both sides, really. Uh, so uh, we'll go with the initial comments. Uh, we are talking um, the macro outlook for the economy. Um, it's a difficult climate, again, uh, to forecast, but we, would, uh, we are encouraging everybody on this uh, to try to forecast for us, right? Even if you have to qualify those statements. Right. Uh, we'll start with Dimanta, go to Lakshini, Nikita, Sanjeeva, and Udishan. 
uh, guys, I'll keep a clock on this one. Uh, uh, can we? Uh, can I ask you to start the month? Uh, take a couple of minutes, maybe three at most. Uh, initial initial thoughts. Sure, sure. Thanks, uh, Shamindra, for organizing this event. So, uh, last time it was in uh, May uh, that we uh, uh, that this was organized, and uh, basically uh, things were not too clear. But if you look at things now in uh, July, uh, I think things are much more uh, clearer than it was in May. And uh, we, as First Capital, are uh, looking at uh, three. Uh, sort of scenarios uh, where uh, initially uh, we were uh, basically looking at uh, the situation improving, uh, the pandemic situation improving around uh, April. However, uh, that wasn't the case. Then uh, with the sporadic uh, cases coming out, uh, we, were, we, we had to switch to scenario two. So uh, we, at that uh, time, we were looking at the uh, situation significantly improving towards uh, in June. And our third scenario was uh, we were looking at uh, a second wave or third wave. Uh, obviously, we had a, a sort of a scare uh, last week also. Uh, but then uh, we would identify ourselves as still in uh, scenario two. So. Uh, Basically, from uh, May to now, uh, our expectations have not uh, changed too much. So in terms of uh, GDP growth, uh, we are still uh, looking at uh, minus uh, GDP growth for 2020, uh, minus 1.4%. Uh, mainly out of that, uh, second quarter and third quarter, uh, we're looking at negative GDP growth of uh, minus 7% and around uh, minus 3%. And uh, so the full year uh, GDP growth outlook is uh, minus 1.4% uh, with the fourth quarter being uh, having a uh, positive GDP growth figure. In terms of uh, recovery, uh, we are seeing uh, economic activity being started and basically uh, recovery process is uh, going on. However, we are uh, broadly lo looking at a W uh, shaped uh, recovery. So there, uh, there is a, a possibility of uh, another uh, downside uh, uh, towards the early or mid uh, next year. However, uh, that's on a, a broader scale. If, we, if I uh, take uh, credit growth as well in line with uh, GDP growth, we are, uh, still uh, haven't changed our forecast as yet. Uh, we are go still going on uh, zero to minus 1.5% uh, uh, credit growth figure uh, in line with our uh, GDP growth outlook. So overall outlook uh, at the moment is that. Uh, that would be my uh, initial comments at the moment. All right. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that, Dimanta. Uh, Lakshini, can I ask you to go next? Initial thoughts. Sure, Shamindra. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so in terms of our forecast, Ramindra, I mean, at the end of March itself, we what we did was we, like you said, it was very difficult to forecast things in this current environment. So we pretty much tackled it on a probability weighted scenario analysis. And um, our base case scenario as of now actually forecasts uh, GDP growth to contract by about 4.5%, 4.5% this year. Um, and why, how we came about that is we literally looked at some of the main subsectors in the services and industry sector. We looked at what the performance was uh, last year compared to the significant changes this year. Um, and we also took into account the fact that our ports are closed, so the services sector will have a significant negative multiplier effect running through. On the external side, we looked at how um, you know the global slowdown will affect the manufacturing sectors. Get a negative multiplier effect on that side. Um, so, I mean, very briefly, just taking those into consideration, our scenario basis pretty much is now on track because we initially forecasted um, the entire pandemic, pandemic and overall the lockdown to start easing gradually by the end of May. And that kind of pretty much played its part. Um, like the month I mentioned, there was a scare of a second wave, but um, what we see is looking ahead, if um, we can, if the government can 
control sort of with minimal lockdowns, having economic sort of um, business activity going at about 50 to 60% with sort of um, minimal lockdowns taking place, um, you will see that activity continue to some extent. Despite that, we forecast the industrial sector to actually um, contract by about 19 to 20% um, in the second quarter, and in the third quarter by about 6 to 8% contraction. Um, in services also, we expect um, you know, a contraction of about 9 to 11% in 2Q. 3Q as well, um, marginally down, um, not too much. We see services picking up a little bit uh, more in the third quarter. But what's essentially going to drive our contraction in our view is um, the big hit on industrials and services. Every, I mean, we didn't see too much of a change or, or it, it continued even during the lockdown, so we don't get um, too much of a change in our view on the agri sector. We expect more actual activity in the agri sector given the import controls. Um, and that's our overall view on the economy at this point. Uh, just, just to make sure we, I heard you right, uh, Lakshi. Uh, uh, industrial sector contraction, second quarter and third quarter, what were the numbers? Uh, second quarter, we expect about a 19 to 20% contraction. Right. Okay, yeah. right. I, that wasn't entirely clear in the audio, I think. Right. Okay, thank you. Thank you for those comments. Um, uh, can I ask, I think, uh, Nikita to go next? Right. So what I can add incrementally to what's been expressed so far is that uh, last time uh, in here, I expected the base case to be a 3% GDP drop in 2020 and uh, recover to a U level around 2022. Uh, given the current considerations now, particularly with the fears of a second wave, I think we have to increase that slightly, our uh, base case scenario to about 4% uh, percent marginally. Um, so from an investment perspective, I think the one thing, the, the one metric that everyone's looking at is the spread of COVID-19. And uh, the numbers have risen significantly since the last time we chatted, but uh, what's working in our behalf is, uh, on, on our behalf is the fact that we've contained the first wave particularly well. But uh, looking at countries like Singapore and even Israel who've managed the first wave uh, phenomenally well, uh, the risks can't be completely overlooked. And uh, so, the fact that uh, we have a much higher, we have 2,700 plus uh, COVID cases right now, but uh, what's working uh, for us is the fact that they come from very specific clusters. And uh, it's, been, it's been about a week since the last uh, social uh, discovery, uh, societal discovery of the uh, last COVID case was made. So uh, we really don't believe that we would go in for another lockdown. Uh, scenario because we've all seen the economic consequences of it and I think the society is mature enough to handle it. Uh, even an increasing scenario, we may see it uh, if, if at all uh, after the elections and uh, we could possibly face it if at all if there is a second uh, wave. Uh, after, this, uh, after the election. So what would really govern the equities this uh, would be? how well we would handle the second wave. The results of the election, uh, I really doubt if uh, the elections would be, any, the results of it would be any surprise. And, uh, and uh, the uh, <clears throat> external sector, how the government would make, a, everyone's looking towards the government to make a, a commitment towards fiscal discipline and uh, uh, repayment, uh, repayment of debt. I, I think that will be a huge, a huge uh, concern for all the investors coming in, particularly for the equity guys who are looking to, uh, to stay in the longer run. Uh, the last one I'm uh, looking at is uh, in 2017, we saw the Pakistan equity market being uh, upgraded to, uh, from emerging to, uh, from frontier to emerging. And this year we are seeing the Kuwait Stock Exchange being upgraded uh, the same way. So Kuwait 
has a significant amount of uh, frontier centric funds. I think about 40% of all frontier funds are invested in Kuwait and they would be looking for a way out. So you're looking at MENA and uh, Asian funds. So we will see some spillover benefit assuming that we have the COVID uh, scenario under control. So right now there is a capital flight towards, uh, towards uh, Pakistan and Vietnam. And uh, yeah, so we just have to get this uh, right to get the foreign money coming sure. in. Right, thanks for that Nikita. Um, uh, Sanjeev, can I ask you to go next? Yes, Shamindra, yeah. Um, so um, I'll add something incrementally to the discussion thus far. Um, we are expecting GDP to contract by around 2%. Um, the main uh, stories here are that, um, I mean, Fitch, it, it's true that Fitch also downgraded their GDP expectation for Sri Lanka uh, from 1% to 1.3% minus. Uh, but uh, yeah, we are still keeping it at, at minus two, um, uh, largely because of the factors that uh, growth drivers like tourism, construction, and consumption are not going to perform that well this year. I mean, it would have been a better year for consumption, given the consumption tax cuts and the increase in uh, disposable income. Um, and then tourism, um, I mean, second quarter, uh, 2020 was technically zero tourist arrivals. And usually June is like the lowest ARR uh, for hotel sector, but uh, this time no tourists. And then uh, even though some of the locals went into hotels during June, uh, overall occupancy for the hotel sector during the second quarter will be around 5 to 10%. So uh, these things are not helping uh, economies growth uh, from that aspect and again, construction for again, all the known reasons. So, but we are expecting a positive recovery next year, probably uh, three to 4%. Uh, um, and then uh, Sri Lanka's GDP growth heading towards uh, its potential economic growth of 5% uh, thereafter. All right. Uh... Thank you, uh, Sanjeev. Udishan, um, any opening thoughts from you? Uh, you're on mute, Udishan. I think, yeah. Hello. Yeah, can hear you now. Yeah. So, uh, hi, everyone. So, start off with, uh, I'm in agreement with, with the outlook in terms of uh, economic growth. We are looking at a negative uh, uh, GDP growth of around 2 to 3% uh, for this year to start off with. Uh, but it has not been a V-shaped recovery as, as what we would have liked it to be. It's, it's, it's uh, more of a U, U or a W kind of recovery that we are seeing right now. Uh, the slow recovery is mainly due to a couple of reasons. We are still seeing our export markets. Uh, the advanced economies are still, uh, you're looking at negative GDP growth according to what IMF is looking at. Uh, so countries like US, Europe, which are a large part of our export markets are taking a beating. Uh, so apparels, which is 5% of our GDP is affected. Then you have worker remittances. We are seeing numbers being about 15, 20% lower compared to last year. Uh, and also uh, in terms of consumption, uh, consumption is still about 15 to 20% lower compared to where it was. Uh, in addition to this, uh, uh, we are seeing a slight recovery in terms of on basic essentials, but keep in mind that imports play a large part of our economy and that component has almost come to a standstill, especially on consumer related imports. Uh, so GDP recovery is going to be slow. It is definitely on an upward trajectory, but it's a gradual improvement that we're seeing. Uh, so our recovery or in terms of the GDP to hit back uh, to where it was, we are looking at at least the second half of 2021. So in light of this, we believe that uh, central bank will continue its uh, uh, easing monetary policy stance uh, in, in light of uh, the negative output cap, which could uh, prevail for at least three to four quarters. Uh, all right, I'll, um, uh, there's a question about elections and, and I didn't pre-warn you that I'm going to ask you about this, but uh, it's, I think it's a foregone conclusion that, and a couple of you mentioned already, that SLPP will form the next government, right? Um, uh, what are, the, the two scenarios are, is it going to have two-thirds or will they be able to get to the two-thirds number 
after the election because you know we've seen uh, we've seen that's possible in sri lanka um, uh, can we uh, what do you guys think uh, about the two scenarios where uh, slpp forms the next government but is well short of a two thirds and uh, and uh, slpp having a two thirds what what if impact will that have on capital markets particularly equity uh quick thoughts uh does anybody want to wade in quick yeah uh, so okay. shall i go in yeah go ahead go ahead yeah so uh basically uh, if we really look at it uh, now uh, what i feel is uh, yes uh, you are correct srpp is uh, likely to uh, form uh, a government and uh, considering the current situation and uh, there is likelihood that uh, they will uh, gain majority but if you uh, look at the history uh, over the last uh, 30 years of uh, elections uh, no party really has uh, come uh, closer to two thirds uh, majority uh, in 2010 of course uh, they did uh, get uh, closer it closer to it but then again uh, basically combined with uh, some other uh, members uh, to basically uh, form the two thirds to do the necessary changes uh, but uh, i think uh, first of all having a stable uh, government is uh, very uh, important uh, for all types of investments and uh, to have a, a policy stability uh, for at least the next 5 years it favors investments and it definitely will uh, favor equity markets as well because uh, uh, can, can i ask you dimanta what what do you think is the likely around the two scenarios sure slpp yeah. will form the government but uh, is there likely to be a flip on you know capital markets particularly equities if there's a two thirds uh, so uh, two thirds will uh, only uh, involve when uh, you, you, two thirds is required only to do constitutional changes no sure. right other than other than that uh, it doesn't uh, really uh, matter but if you have a substantial majority uh, mm-hmm. from 113 that mm-hmm. does matter rather than having just one uh, 113 or 113 mm-hmm. if you do have 125 to 130 that uh, gives confidence about the stability of the government so uh, uh, for, for that reason yes yes for that um, reason got it uh, sanjeev uh, do you want to wade in um, um, i mean two thirds for constitutional change but it also uh, makes uh, if if we address the stability question you know it's also stability at another level right yes shandra so the point here is i think uh, i agree with dimanth here uh, because if, if you i mean it, now it's proven in sri lanka coalition governments m- may not work so we need to have one strong uh, party uh, ruling the country whatever the party that's going to emerge victorious so uh, the key here is that we need to have proper policy stability and then there has to be a government to take decisions and so uh because after that only even if they prefer uh, that they can go for uh, hard reforms now this has been a thing that is you know that has been told by imf and all the other institutions that sri lanka needs to adopt hard reforms or tough reforms and but we have not done that so you know i think it's high time and uh, we can use this uh, uh, uh you know environment to do these things you know we have seen companies uh, i mean if you take the bank in sector we have seen some of the things that they said it will take some 10 years to do that they have already adopted it because of covid so you know um, yeah. i i think this is a good uh, time to uh, do that kind of uh, tough reforms which will actually help uh, sri lankan economy to uh, you know go to a better state uh, let me ask you this is is a uh, the prospect of a SLPP a government with a stable majority already priced in in the equity market possibly is yes okay lakshmi you want to start there uh, is it priced in you think and um, what about stability what's that stability question two thirds does it really even matter 
So, Shamindra, I think, look, at the end of the day, policy uncertainty has been one of the biggest issues we've had in the past, right? Um, you talk to any foreign investor, that is one of the big first questions that you get. Um, so, to this majority, at least it gives a direction to say, okay, look, policy, policy direction and as well as policy completion will actually be done to a bigger extent than it was in the last couple of years. So to me, that will be the indicator and that will be the direction that investors also could be looking for. Um, in terms of has it already been priced in, I think to a, to a certain level, yes. Um, but also I would expect a little bit more hype going in towards the election as well, because I think it is something that everyone is looking for. At the end of the day, I think everyone's looking for some news, right? Some good news at the end of the day. Um, as long as it's positive, um, I think that will go, sort of give that incentive that is needed. Uh, got it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, 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 we have uh, a forecast on uh, on exp forecast GDP growth for this year, right? I'll just run through the numbers. Dimanta said minus 1.4%. Lakshini said uh, minus 4 to 4.5%. Nikita is at a minus 4%. Sanjeeva is at a minus 2%. Udishan is, is at a minus two to three percent, right? If I got those numbers right, guys. Um, okay, let's talk uh, two other macro numbers just to uh, make sure so that we have a foundation for for the conversation today. Uh, one is um, uh, one is the uh, interest rates, uh, and uh, what do you think will happen with the exchange rate? Uh, if you can bring fiscal uh, deficits into that again, useful. So interest rates, exchange rates, deficit, can we get some uh, forecast numbers so that we have a foundation for discussion? Uh, Dimantha, can I ask you to quickly go at it? And budget deficit also. Yeah, sure. So uh, basically, if I start off with the uh, trade deficit uh, numbers, uh, basically we are looking at uh, uh, on our scenario two, we are uh, we are currently, uh, we feel that the exports are likely to uh, dip by around uh, 30%. That is goods export and goods imports uh, likely to dip by about uh, 40%. Uh, then we have the service exports uh, uh, dipping by about uh, 45% and service imports uh, dipping by about uh, 43%. So if I look at the current account uh, deficit, uh, it's actually... Uh, favorable uh, to us. Uh, we are only looking at a minus uh, 100 million uh, dollars of uh, uh, trade def uh, current account deficit, so which is uh, significantly favorable. However, if I go into the BOP, uh, we are looking at uh, a problem in terms of uh, attracting FDIs and also uh, we feel that this year uh, the borrowing options can be uh, limited. Uh, so there will be a, a possibility that we uh, pay some of our uh, foreign currency uh, loans uh, through our reserves. So uh, with that, uh, we are looking at uh, the balance of payments uh, deficit of around $1.8 billion. So uh, with that, uh, what we are looking at is reserve numbers coming down to around uh, five and a half uh, billion dollars for scenario two uh, by uh, end of this year. So with that, uh, if I look at uh, interest rates, uh, basically uh, on the yield curve, uh, bond rates we feel have uh, bottomed out. However, uh, there is a possibility of at least another uh, one uh, monetary easing or possibly another uh, one uh, rate cut possibly in the range of uh, 50 basis points that we are looking at. But uh, if you look at the uh, yield curve, uh, we feel that the market has already been adjusted for uh, that 50 basis points as well. Uh, if that's not given, obviously the market may be uh, disappointed. But uh, uh, in addition to that, uh, now, though the interest rates we feel that has bottomed out, uh, I'm talking in terms of the bond market, uh, we don't uh, feel that uh, there is likely to be an immediate uptrend due to the lack of uh, demand in the system and is a lack of uh, credit also 
in the system uh, so with that uh, we don't see uh, any sort of pressure coming in at least uh, until the fourth quarter of this year so uh, uh, only issue Got that it. we may look at is if the liquidity levels uh, come down a bit further but uh, at the moment uh, we feel that uh, interest rates can come down uh, can uh, remain at these levels however lending rates of course uh, can come down uh, a bit further in line with the uh, bond yields good um, uh, nikita can i ask you to uh, weigh in also uh, 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 try and give uh, the month anticipates that there could be a e- uh, further cut of 50 basis points though you think uh, rates are generally closer to the bottom than now um, uh, what do you think nikita and uh, also weigh in on the deficit if you can Sure. So on the interest rates, uh, I have a slightly different scenario to the monthless. So I still think we have a little more room to go on both lending and benchmark rates. Uh, I think uh, the the ex- this is the highest amount of highest liquidity that we have seen in the banking sector. I, I think historically, and still the loan book isn't growing. So this year, uh, I think interest rates weren't a factor for the loan book growth at all. It, uh, the the lack of growth in the loan book is a factor of low demand, and uh, so I, I I foresee about another hundred basis point drop in uh, in the benchmark rates in the next twelve months, and uh, given the fact that uh, and and I believe this would happen across the yield curve, and I, I think the yield curve could possibly see a shift, uh, see a downward shift. and uh, this would uh, probably be bond positive when uh, and uh, uh, this this probably won't happen in a uh, in a actively managed bond portfolio uh, on uh, on the uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, uh, on the deficit or on the deficit, deficit or yeah. inflation any uh, thoughts so um, on the deficit i believe we will have about uh, 10 or 11% uh, deficit uh, this year and um, so it's okay, just to- just to put what you're saying in context on interest rate um, rates uh, you are anticipating 100 basis points which is 1% uh, one year rates on the yield curve are about 4.8 i don't know is that approximate yeah it, it, yeah one year is about 4.7 correct 4.7 so we are looking at 3.7 you say okay yes. uh, by year end right by year and end. you are anticipating central bank will also ease yes yes approximately yes. by that amount uh, i uh, yes yes okay so so this would reflect uh, across the uh, you know from plr downwards and uh, so on on the deficit side sorry go ahead so uh the the deficit would continue to be low 49% of government's uh, tax revenue comes from imports so the lack of imports uh, would continue to weigh in heavily on our lack of revenue so uh, 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 i foresee about 11% uh, of the gdp being the deficit for this year okay on inflation i don't see a big change from the current numbers there uh, what we will see for the rest of this year is a significant lack of demand uh so uh, that, that would give inflation numbers some stability in my view um so for those of you uh, i'm i'm talking to about everybody else who's joined us on zoom um you can put questions already several questions one of those questions is about the negative real interest rate scenario and is this going to be uh, I'll, i'll put this question to sanjeev right while you're addressing um, your forecast on interest rate uh, on uh, on interest rates also talk about if you can um, the negative interest rate scenario that we are in is that going to boost consumption or you know this is not the play uh, or is it not the play that is going to be, we are going to see in the economy you know uh, people won't be looking at negative interest rates before they consume yes yeah, so let's look at the scenarios right now i mean i mean despite whatever the action that central bank may take uh, what what actually they have to do you know 
um, we are looking at um, money market liquidity went up to even 209 billion overnight liquidity went up to 209 billion late june i think june 26th or somewhere so that that's historically really high now it has come down to yesterday all the whole system parked around 132 billion with the central bank at 4.5 percent so you know, you know banks are not lending out uh, whether i mean many participants in the economy including the president would prefer actually this money uh, being parked with uh, the economic agents who are actually struggling to come out uh, of this uh, scenario so all these rate cuts were done by the central bank srr 300 and policy interest rates 250 just to accommodate this you know credit growth is not picking up now we have inflation at 6.3 uh, 12 month yield went down to 4.86 so we are looking at 144 minus uh, you know negative real interest rates so you know cutting more interest rates will add on to that and banks also need to understand that uh, you know uh, you can't make i mean you can't play this game on a continuous basis but you have to uh, for, to be fair on them they also have to understand i mean uh, to be fair on them uh, uh, there is a thing like this like you know the first customers who will approach a bank will be the customers who are in the crib and you know banks will uh, naturally say no so uh, this is the uh, thing that they have to balance. But then again, uh, I think uh, the monetary authority or the central bank should uh, closely uh, look into this uh, because cutting rates and uh, releasing liquidity, I think is not the uh, required thing right now. Uh, wh what's required is identifying the exactly uh, uh, exact sectors that require the finance and then uh, ensuring that they so uh, you address that aspect in that way because I'm also expecting around 10% budget deficit, which means debt to GDP of 82% last year and will go up to slightly above 90%. So, uh, you know, that's a bad number as a country. So uh, we need to uh, fix these things going forward. And um, I mean, if you ask anyone, um, I mean, anyone in this panel or who has borrowed, uh, who's in the audience, I mean, these are like really low interest rates right now. I mean, you can just take a loan and then, you know, um, start building a house or something. And then uh, you, you know, I mean, uh, assuming the, there won't be a sovereign okay. default, uh, yeah. which I think uh, most of the uh, people in the audience will agree. Uh, technically, uh, you will be uh, making a good deal out of it. Cool. Uh, thanks for that, Sanjeeva. But I mean, the, the, the other thing to consider is while we've pumped liquidity to this level and once consumption starts picking up, we, we may, may have to unwind this liquidity at an equally rapid level. Otherwise, it may, may hit, our, hit us on the uh, exchange rate. Right. Uh, that, that could be one, of, one concern that uh, on a macroeconomic front that we may have to consider. Yeah, from an import point of view, now, uh, I mean, we've seen 1.7 billion uh, monthly import bill coming down to around 1 billion. And from export point of view, 1 billion export uh, receipt has come down to, to around 550 million. So technically, we are making a saving there and that's helping the currency. And what's reduced from imports is technically white goods, vehicles and stuff like that. So that, that's technically actually helping the currency also despite all these rate cuts. Otherwise, you know, there would have been vehicle imports happening and then uh, white good imports happening, which has not happened thus far. So uh, that's technically helping the currency. But my take is that uh, once the government is formed after elections, uh, there will be stability. And then technically, uh, most of the projects that uh, have been, you know, moving slow will start to uh, happen with uh, credit growth uh, gradually picking up. So I don't expect uh, interest rates. I mean, I don't think it's required to cut uh, interest rates, uh, despite the massive liquidity. Got it. Got it, Sanjeev. Uh, Lakshi, can I go to you uh, again, uh, very quickly on interest rates and uh, the liquidity situation? Um, if you can touch on deficit, also go ahead. Um, so look, in terms of, um, let me just talk on the deficit first, right? Um, we forecast the overall deficit to reach about 9 to 9.8% 9 of uh, GDP this year. And that's purely coming from lower revenues as some of the others have also spoken 
work. Uh, but what we also expect is that the government did curb on their expenditure. And we saw that in the first four months data as well, where government expenditure, especially on the public uh, expenditure side, uh, and capital expenditure came down quite a bit. So we do see the government uh, taking those measures as needed. Um, and that's why we think the deficit uh, will be around where it's uh, around the 9.8% 9, 9 um, levels. Um, going on to the liquidity, right? Yes, there's massive liquidity, excess liquidity in the market. And if you look at the reason for it, I mean, look, on the fiscal side, if you look at the overall fiscal stimulus that the government was able to do, the overall, the total stimulus was literally less than percent of GDP. Um, you look at some of the other countries, the fiscal stimulus was much larger. And that's purely because the government is not in a position to take those measures, which is why they're so heavily dependent on the monetary side. And which is exactly why we've seen these monetary, um, you know, the, the key policy rates coming down to this extent. Um, so it's literally making that space available for when banks do start lending and the consumer uh, demand for loans start coming in as well. And I think some of the other things like the credit guarantee schemes uh, that were introduced, um, a bit more concessions towards the construction sector, um, those I think would play well. Uh, but I agree. I think there is a bit of a wait and see approach till the elections are over and done with. But agreed, there is excess liquidity in the market um, a bit more because as soon as the SIR was cut, for example, you saw a massive uh, amount of funds coming into, into the SVF. So um, that, that to me should not be happening, but there also should be a mechanism for the banks to start lending as well because I think that is also in place. Um, in terms of rates, we, we also expect there to be a bit of further cut in key policy rates, uh, maybe about basis points, um, just to sort of stimulate the economy and give that space that is needed, um, and thereby rates also sort of reflect the uh, Thanks for that. So, yeah, the absence of uh, fiscal stimulus, we've uh, dependent on dependent on money, monetary stimulus. Uh, Thanks for that, Lakshi. Udishan, you want to weigh in on rates? This is your core business. Yeah, so uh, I agree on the fact that uh, the liquidity as of now uh, is at 135 billion rupees, quite excess at the moment. So even though the central bank has been pumping in liquidity to the system, people are not borrowing yet. Uh, because of the uncertainty, businesses are not borrowing for investments. Uh, even the banks are a bit reluctant to lend out to consumers given the credit quality issues which is why the money which is flowing in is going into financial investment. So money is ideally coming into the GSEX, the, the financial markets, pushing down the years. So uh, we believe this interest rate environment is going to continue. Uh, and hence, we believe that rates could down, come down by another 70, 80 basis points. Uh, I'm, I'm referring to the T-bill here. Uh, what will support this is that inflation overall uh, will start coming down. So what we are seeing right now is supply side inflation, which, is, which will start adjusting as supply comes in through. Uh, also, globally, all countries are going through an easing cycle. So that will also kind of help us uh, in terms of maintaining these low interest rates. Uh, in addition to that, the exchange rate uh, for our benefit has been quite stable as of now, or, or has been appreciating over the last few years. So for all these reasons, uh, we are fairly certain that uh, this, uh, the rates will be on a lower end. And given that output gap is going to be negative for the next four quarters at least, uh, the central bank will be forced to look at further easing measures uh, in the next uh, two to three quarters. Okay, so um, if, if you talk to anybody out there about the macro situation, one thing, the, the big question that pops up is, is um, uh, the possibility of a sovereign default. I think there is uh, $1 billion uh, uh, international sovereign bond uh, that is uh, expected to come uh, mature this year. That may not proved to be that bigger challenge given, uh, given that our reserves are fairly solid. But uh, the maturing sovereign bonds over the next two years, 2021 and 2022, I don't know if anybody has a number for that, uh, are significant, right? Um, you know, this is an important question for, for capital markets and for the economy in general. This can change the trajectory of everything, right? Um, you know, I'll ask you to be simplistic at first, right? And then let's discuss, uh, the, uh, try to understand why you think so, right? What are the, ch what are the chances of 
a potential default in 2021 or 2022, you know, can you put a percentage on it? You know, there is a 30% chance. What do you think? Uh, sure, it's scenarios, but let's start with that. Uh, Udishan, can I ask you? Uh, I would say the probability is pretty less. So, 0 to 10% is what I would go with. Uh, okay. Uh, is this, um, uh, the okay. only justification I'm saying is that uh, the government will be forced to take some kind of fiscal consolidation measures or enter into debt moratoriums to manage the situation. So, on that basis, it's a 0 to 10% probability that we're looking at in terms of. Okay. Uh, Dimanta. Uh, yeah, so uh, on uh, my grounds also, uh, I think it's uh, chances are very low. Uh, zero to uh, ten percent is what I'm also uh, looking at. Uh, mainly, uh, it's uh, it's like this now. Uh, why most people think uh, there could be uh, debt default is our debt to GDP levels are pretty high. Uh, of course, uh, I think uh, total uh, debt to GDP uh, as at end last year was about uh, 89 percent now if we uh, look at uh, this year with the uh, new interest that's uh, coming in and the rollover of uh, those debt uh, i am i'm sure we are the, going to go uh, well above 95 percent closer to probably 96 uh, 97 percent as well and also uh, we have a lot of uh, money printed uh, uh, in the economy and uh, the only reason why the uh, currency is uh, at this current level is because of the import restrictions. Once that starts uh, lifting, lifting, uh, then the currency is also uh, likely to adjust when the demand starts coming into the system. Uh, without that, uh, it's unlikely that GDP growth will also grow, mainly uh, because uh, our uh, country, uh, the export to GDP percentage is only about 10% and we run mainly on consumption. So consumption drives uh, GDP growth. So without that, and that comes mainly through imports. So without that, that's not going to be there. Now, but, uh, but important thing is uh, this year's debt to GDP, uh, we are also looking at uh, around, uh, sorry, not debt to GDP, the budget deficit to GDP, uh, we are also looking at 10%. Uh, so, we feel that the borrowing requirement of the government is significantly high. So, that's why uh, we feel that the, this liquidity uh, can be uh, absorbed with the bankruptcies that are potentially likely to come in and with the government requirement of uh, borrowing, uh, the liquidity could slowly uh, go away. Right. Uh, so, can I ask you whether you think the, the billion dollars maturing this year can be turned over? It's very unlikely. Uh, what we feel is that uh, overall this year we have about 6 billion of foreign currency debt uh, to be repaid. Uh, we feel that uh, the government will manage to roll over about uh, 4.5 billion of uh, billion dollars of debt and the balance uh, creates the uh, BOP, uh, bulk of the BOP uh, deficit. So the reserves come down. So basically we will be paying it out of the reserves. And for next year, uh, we will. There's a high likelihood that we will uh, look at uh, privatizations because you can see e already the government has started uh, this uh, thermostic model type of uh, private company. It's called Selendiva. Uh, They've already uh, created it, uh, and they have a, already have a structure. Fifty-one percent going to the government. That sort of thing going on. They will. There, there's likelihood that they will try and raise money through uh, that area. So that could have obviously for foreign investment coming in. It may not be the traditional foreign investment that comes in as well. Got so, it. Uh, that uh, could so, be okay. so, so what you're forecasting is that the government will repay the 1 billion invest, international sovereign bond maturing this year plus some of the other debt through, through reserves, right? Yes, exactly. Okay. Uh, Sanjeev, take that uh, question on yourself, right? Uh, very briefly, uh, will we be able to turn over debt this year, next year, etc.? Do you think we'll have, will we be able to go to the market? If not, what's the strategy? So this year, given the markets are muted, uh, uh, we will have to let it go through our reserves. Uh, but uh, as we discussed, I think since, the, since there are import restrictions, 
even after adjusting through reserves, we will have more than a five month cover for imports, even though the import bill has now come down to around a billion dollars a month. So uh, that's going to uh, uh, create a safe zone uh, for the government uh, in the uh, near term. But come next July, there is another uh, sovereign bond to be repaid. Uh, by that time, uh, uh, we will have to uh, kind of fast track most of the uh, economic activity and then uh, uh, you know, hope that uh, international market will be open for us so that we don't have to let it go through our reserves. Uh, now, th there is uncertainty here, but, but the positive aspect here is I think uh, last week or somewhere, uh, WHO announced that uh, there is good progress made uh, in uh, coming up with this vaccine for COVID-19. So, which means, but, uh, and they said it will be commercially available only during uh, the early part of 2021. So, which means we can, uh, uh, you know, comfortably expect that by April 2021, we will not that not have this issue of, you know, uh, uh, you know, having to take uh, serious measures like this, you know, I mean, if, just to talk about uh, if you have a hotel, you have 50% occupancy called as full occupancy, you know, you have to, you know, in the restaurant, you have to just avoid one table and then people will be sitting uh, in, in the adjacent table. So likewise. Okay. Uh, well, Lakshya, I'll come to you. Uh, so prospect for sovereign debt default, uh, is it low? What's the percentage? What are the factors that will weigh in? How are we going to manage the next few years? Um, I assign a little bit of a higher probability. I don't think there will be a default, um, Shaminder. But to me, look, we came into 2020 with a good buffer for repayments, right? Through the Active Liability Management Act last year, the central bank did raise excess funding. So that's why I have very low. I don't think we are going to um, default this year's ISD. That's that's already done. With. To my my bigger concern is that there isn't a very very sort of um, repayment schedule and or a funding schedule, sorry, available for next year. And this is a bit of a concern to me at the moment. Uh, we have four billion uh, of repayments next year, of which there is a one billion ISD in July. The ISD will be repaired. Um, you know, if even if the reserves are, are used for it, I do think that it will be repaired. My bigger concern is for the others as well, because if rollover is not possible, if um, moratoriums, which is the government is in talks with at the moment uh, for some of their repairments at the moment, are don't come through, um, what the government does is my concern. I know that there will be short-term measures taken, but the impact of those short-term measures and uh, how the government actually takes uh, steps to refinance is still unclear to me. So on that basis, I would assign maybe about a 10 to 15 percent probability, but I do not think that we will report on our requirements. Right, Nikita, uh, take a step Just, back. Uh, so, uh, Sanjeeva, your probability of default is 5 percent, right? Yes, uh, it's 5 percent and uh, the assumption here is that uh, government will, uh, with the new government, the, they will go for IMF facility, but then obviously they will have to go for hard reforms. That, that will be the condition of IMF. So we will have the RCF after the government is formed. So, so there is an expectation that hard reforms will happen. Several of you now all, already have. Comment. They technically do not have options, uh, but I think have to resort to IMF requirements. Right. Nikita, hard reforms will happen. Uh, sovereign default. What are the prospects? So let me address sovereign defaults first. Uh, again, I will stick with the flock here and say that uh, the likelihood is low, very low. Uh, we simply can't afford one. And uh, whatever uh, difficulties we will have in reaching the capital markets would probably be offset by bilateral loans. Uh, now, <clears throat> now, looking at the average, uh, 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 capital market loan that we have obtained in the last 10 years or so is six years in tenure, uh, six and a half years, uh, six and a half percent is the average uh, rate. But if you look at a uh, average loan taken from China, you're looking at a five-year moratorium, uh, of, 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 a five-year uh, uh, grace period, and three and a half, four percent uh, rate going in for 25 or 30 years. Mm -hmm. So that's a significant difference. And given China's uh, level of liquidity right now, 
uh, it probably won't be a big deal given our significance in the BRI. Uh, on uh, hard reforms, we will definitely see the government going into IMF after the election. Uh, particularly for this government, IMF is a very politically sensitive issue. And uh, I'm looking for an, uh, for a, uh, I am looking at IFC as, uh, as uh, I'm looking at IMF as a, a catalyst for us to get into hard reforms, but looking at how they've dealt with countries like Nigeria. Now, uh, Nigeria did everything in the last three years uh, against IMF's recommendations, and they still ended up with three billion rupees in uh, in April, in April or May. Uh, the, all uh, say twelve billion dollars of foreign capital is stuck there, and uh, they are unable to be. Uh, 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 their movement is restricted, and uh, despite IMF warning them very severely on uh, ease of capital movement, uh, they didn't do it, and Nigeria still got. Uh, the facility that they wanted. So I don't know at this time uh, in the bang in the middle of the pandemic, how pressing the IMF would be to uh, press reforms on us uh, uh, um, linked to their link to their health. So we, we definitely see ourselves see ourselves uh, going for IMF, but uh, I don't know how hard we'll be pressed to follow their pillars of discipline. Right. Uh, I'll, I'll ask you to quick each um, a few of you to weigh in, right? If we are looking at hard reforms, what are those few big ones that will figure in a conversation with an IMF, with the IMF? Uh, or, you know, just, just, you know, if you're just interested in the fiscal side of things, again, what are those ones that, that matter, right? SEOs matter, uh, I guess, you know, um, uh, can you talk us through, okay, avoid uh, sovereign default, what are, very quickly, what are those few things we can do? Hard reforms. Uh, higher direct taxes, higher portion of direct taxes, uh, profitable SOEs. Um, I'd sure. say widening the tax net. Cool. Udishan, can I, can I bring you in? Uh, direct taxes, uh, SEO uh, challenges that we've had, you're on mute. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, it, it would be in the form of both direct and indirect taxes, uh, given that we bought down, uh, if it was an IMF, IMF program, so initially if you look at it, you raised our VAT rates from 11 to 15% uh, and then bought it down to uh, 7 to 8% now. Uh, so what I feel is that there could be an additional form of taxes coming in. Uh, it might be not directly VAT as such, but it might be in some other form of indirect tax which comes in. Uh, also, what the government could do is that, uh, given that they want to control imports, they might kind of uh, increase the import duties on non-essentials. Uh, so those would be things that I think the government will be initially looking at, which would also help the government in certain way to to manage the the exchange uh, rate situation for the moment. The the tax cut we had in in uh, early this year was was massive, you know, because it uh, targeted the biggest component of uh, revenue, right, which is uh, consumption taxes. So so you're essentially saying you will we will see some sort of a reversal of that. Uh, we will have to because that's the largest component of our of tax uh, collection. So uh, we will have to increase it, and also uh, most of the benefit of the VAT reduction didn't be uh, wasn't felt by the consumer. So actually, it wasn't really the businesses benefited, but it didn't really pass on to the consumers as such, uh, which is why I believe it might be counterproductive to, to keep uh, VAT rates lower. All right. Uh, I'll go to Lakshi. Lakshi, what do you think about uh, hard reforms, taxes in particular? You know, will, we have to, will the government have to reverse those uh, tax concessions? It's there. Yeah. I would honestly think so, Shamitra. My problem is this, right? Um, we're already looking at a contraction of 4.5%. So you're looking at slow economic activity. And on top of that, if the government does have to sort of implement high fiscal policy by increasing those taxes, um, it's going to be a bigger impact. But I honestly think it's something that has to be done at this point. Um, and in terms of how, you know, what reforms are, in SOE has to be uh, one of the key priorities. I think this is one thing that they will really focus on to make it make SOEs much more profitable um, and also reduce the expenditure uh, on, on the SOE side. Um, 
in addition to that, look, I think as much as they can, they will try to increase their revenue from uh, whatever they can, and they will curtail their expenditure. I, I do feel that they will maintain their fiscal uh, expenditure to some extent. Um, but overall, I think there, there are some very hard decisions to make post-election. Okay, uh, Sanjeev, very quickly on um, uh, what are those one or two reforms, big ones, uh, and taxation? Uh, will uh, VAT or consumption taxes have to go up? Uh, yeah, so right now, I mean, uh, what, what, what has been increased is, uh, even though it has not been reduced, fuel. So, I, you know, global fuel prices are at very low levels, but we are still paying high taxes on it. So despite all those cuts, uh, this is adding on to uh, the you know prices uh, in general. So I mean, I think overall what IMF would suggest is technically take the revenue portion up. And uh, so this kind of mechanism obviously works when it comes to uh, revenue collection because it's collected at the source and evasion is very minimal. Uh, but uh, so this was actually uh, adopted by the same government uh, maybe some time back, if you can recall. So uh, whether it will be uh, increase of direct taxes uh, or indirect taxes, uh, I'm not really sure what they'll go for. But I think uh, uh, more in the lines of uh, direct taxes, they can go for uh, uh, and then gradually uh, increase uh, indirect taxes in the form of VAT or something, but then reduce full taxes so that you control inflation. Okay, there's uh, there's something on um, on the swap facilities that Sri Lanka is going uh, negotiating with the with India, US, etc. Right? Uh, are are these just going to boost reserves, or can they be used for debt repayments? Because uh, Dimanka, you you suggested that uh, uh, you anticipate government will use its reserves to repay the debt this year. Can the swap facilities be used, uh, or are they just boost reserves? Uh, so basically, uh, you, you saw last uh, few years, uh, we expand in the uh, length of the uh, repayment cycle, but uh, similar to the 2015-16 uh, period, now uh, we will have to, since there's not much of funding available in the market, we will have to start looking for uh, short-term uh, funding. So that's where the straps come in. I think uh, we are looking at about a billion, billion and a half uh, straps from India and also some straps uh, coming from uh, China. Uh, however, uh, basically these are uh, short term and uh, what will happen is uh, next year's uh, uh, foreign currency repayment por portion is going to increase through the swap. Uh, so, uh, because we'll we will be replacing a lot. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, unless we, uh, so basically next year, so that will be one thing we'll have to, another thing we have to roll over next year then. Sure. Right? So, Got it. So uh, uh, with that, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll start shifting this towards uh, equity, right? Uh, let's, uh, let's get some quick numbers in about what you anticipate will be, uh, will happen with earnings in the 2020 calendar year, or you can take the 2020, 2021 financial year, whichever one you can use as a benchmark. Um, uh, give me an earnings uh, for, for the universe that you're covering. You each must be covering, you know, 30 to 50 stocks, right? For that number of stocks, tell us what the number of stocks are and, and what you think will happen on earnings. Can I ask uh, uh, Lakshi to go first? Do you have that number with you, Lakshi? Um, yeah, Shomendra, I mean, we cover roughly about 50 to 55 stocks um, on a very on an ongoing basis. And uh, what do you think will happen with the earnings in the next one year-ish? Um, look, I think it will take some time to recover. Um, some sectors will perform and um, recover a bit faster than some of the others. Um, sectors like your FMCG, like your... Um, the construction also we may see positive uh, numbers going into about the second half of next year. Um, so look, at the end of the day, you will literally see the earnings pick up only towards second half of uh, 21 is what we think. Um, there will be some that will have a bit more of a gradual pickup starting from the end of this year. Um, some of your FMCG companies will start because once that personal care demand does pick up, you will see some of those um, do well. 
um, those with essential um, you know, goods uh, exposure will also start picking up sooner than some of the others. And then on the other side, we will have your tourism sector that will really take much longer to recover than others. Uh, what is the earnings number? Do you, do you think you have a number for the 50, 55 stocks? Um, I can't give you a number at this point of time, Shaminda. But it'll possibly be contract, right? Um, yes, yes. Right. Nikita? Universe plus the earnings number. So my universe is about 22 companies right now. So for the calendar year 2020, well, it's a contraction. So if in, um, mine is uh, banking heavy. So if you look at the banking, the lending book is going to contract. The downward slide of the interest rate, it's going to be margin negative. So you're looking at the banking sector in the next, say, 12 to 18 months, uh, consuming, uh, say, the ROE is going to be uh, less than their uh, cost of capital. Um, for FMCGs, I think uh, the uh, discretionary spending will suffer. We have about 40% uh, of our workforce in near um, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in the informal sector, and, and they are probably the worst, worst affected uh, from the pandemic and the shutdowns. So, uh, and, and that, and also uh, remittances, I think the remittances will suffer by about 15 to 30 percent in the next two years from uh, from the returnees and the, and from the ones who are there, the jobs that are lost. So we see the construction, particularly the tile sector, is heavily dependent uh, historically. They've been heavily dependent on the consumption numbers, and that will see a slide. So, so on uh, earnings, Nikita, you think on a banking heavy twenty two stocks, uh, earnings will decline by ten percent. No, that's that's tough to say. Okay, um, so it's, a, it's a difficult number to focus. Cool, no worries. Uh, think about it. Sanjeeva, universe plus earnings number very quickly. Yeah. So we cover around 35 companies, uh -huh. but in order for the audience to understand it easily, I'll uh, talk about SL, PSN, uh, SN, PSL 20. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you look, uh, I mean, if you uh, think of that, uh, earnings expectations will fall around, I mean, Irania uh, growth for earnings will be minus 46% uh, for 2020. Uh, and then uh, it will go up to 42% growth uh, for next year. So so this year, this financial year, you're saying yeah. on the 32 Take stocks? January to December earnings uh, versus 2019, 46%. Yep. Down 46%. Wow. I'm talking about EPS, EPS growth, not just the profit, EPS. Okay, got it. Got it. And it'll bounce back pretty much in a year. 42%, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, right. Right. Okay. Profitability falls nearly half. I mean, just to give you an idea uh, uh, about the revisions we did uh, pre-COVID, uh, from the pre-COVID profits after COVID, uh, we did kind of 44% downward revisions to our profits. Okay. Uh, Dimanta, what do you think will happen with earnings very quickly? Yeah. So uh, we have a, a market earnings figure uh, that we forecast so all the companies' earnings uh, cumulatively. For uh, 2020, uh, we are looking at, uh, uh, so previously uh, when we did this uh, forum, uh, we've actually looked at the market earnings coming down by around 26%. Uh, However, uh, we've gone through uh, 150 basis points of a, a policy rate cut and 200 basis points of a SRR cut, which has actually changed our uh, numbers uh, slightly. Currently now, uh, we are looking at uh, 2020 earnings, market earnings declining by around uh, 22%. So from the, for the two months, uh, we've actually have, have a slight upgrade. And then uh, we are looking at uh, earnings actually uh, increasing by around uh, 16 to uh, 18% uh, for 2021. So as far as the um, 
equities are concerned, it looks like it's V-shaped, right? You bound, uh, fall down and you recover that in a year. If, if, if you just limit the recovery to the equities from what you guys are talking about. Udishan, what are you, what's your universe size and what is the earnings? Uh, so our universe size is about 35 companies in total. Uh, in terms of earnings estimate, I, I, I really can't give you a figure as such, but I would uh, go with somewhere close to 30%. Uh, why I say that uh, it's difficult to give a figure right now is that uh, given that 40 to 50 percent of the earnings, market earnings, come from the banking and finance sector. Uh, so the difficult part is right now that uh, we really don't know what kind of impairments that will be recognized, given that until March or September, you're going to see that uh, uh, the, the moratorium is taking place. Uh, so whether the impairments will be recognized this year, or whether it will be postponed to this year, will make, uh, next year will make a big difference in terms of the earnings numbers. And also keep in mind the central bank has made changes in terms of how you recognize interest income, uh, whether you can recognize sovereign bond gains, uh, shifting it around. So it's not going to be an easy thing to do in terms of figuring out and, and a forecast in terms of uh, income or what percentage uh, decline you will see in terms of the income. Right. Let me ask you this, uh, because most of you are covering the banks anyway, right? Uh, in, the, in the market overall, it looks like you're forecasting a V-shaped, you know, in equities, you're forecasting a V-shaped recovery, right? But with financial institutions, will it be any other shape? Will it be a W-shaped uh, recovery? Because will, will there be a second hit uh, coming out of uh, impairments over the long term? Yeah, so I think if, uh, because as of now, banks also are like us, they don't have a clue in terms of what the outcome is going to be after September, October, right? So, which may kind of fool them to, to recognize impairments towards next year. Uh, but the, the, the good thing is that this year, they, could, they can still recognize interest income on even the debt moratorium component. Uh, initially, it was, uh, uh, it, was on, it was that you can't charge interest on any of the uh, moratorium component, but now uh, it's only on the fixed component that you're supposed to charge a concessionary interest rate of 7%, but uh, the remaining you can charge whatever rate uh, that you want. Uh, so uh, because of that, I think your earnings might not look that great, but uh, the banks will have to make the call whether they want to recognize it early in terms of uh, without waiting for the big hit next year, uh, whether they want to make some kind of provision for possible impairments next year. Right. Uh, Sanjeev, uh, Lakshi, I'll put this to you. Uh, uh, looking at how equities are being priced, the multiples on which equities are being priced right now, it does not seem to suggest that there is an anticipation of uh, a sovereign default like issued next year. Yeah. Lakshi? That's right, um, Shamitra. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Just to add a point uh, on the earnings. Uh, so if you exclude actually the multinationals, uh, ROEs are technically expected to go up to around 17% next year from 12% this year. And this is just for the same PSL 20. ROEs are expected to go around, okay, right. Up to 17% uh, from 12% average. Well, yeah. Right. This is excluding multinationals because it distorts the picture. Okay, so uh, so the big ones are tobacco, CTC, and, yeah, uh, Nestle, maybe. Nestle, and uh, uh, Lubes. Okay, those are the big three. Uh, yeah, those th multinationals listed That's right. in uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, uh, what about uh, price to uh, price to earnings? Uh, what is it now, right now, Sanjeev? If you don't mind telling us all, and then uh, so uh, what does that suggest? Yeah, I mean, um, it, it now the problem we have with regard to uh, foreign investments coming in also has a thing to play with this because uh, I mean, our market fee is around uh, nine point something right now, now, which is kind of similar to Singapore and Hong Kong. So whereas, as you know, uh, we have uh, bigger problems when it comes to sovereign defaults and all these questions that you asked right now. So uh, first of all, obviously, at, at these cheap levels, these markets will start to get uh, funds. And, and then uh, we'll get, uh, hopefully then we'll have a stable government uh, and, and a stable, I mean, at least uh, some path of uh, recovery. Right. Uh, uh, Lakshi, can I bring you in on uh, PEs? Uh, we seem to be pretty, uh, we were very, we fell, PEs fell quite fast, but they've now recovered to wherever everybody else is, right? Is that the case? 
that's right, Shamitra. I mean, the, you did see a good recovery uh, once market opened. I think the issue there was, you know, there was so much of uncertainty as to, especially from the foreign side, you know, on, on that prolonged market closure as well. Um, but look, looking forward, I think once there is a bit more clarity on policy and on the fiscal side, on stability, you will see uh, the market being a little bit more attractive. But that being said, right, once market open and what you're seeing now is a lot, there are a lot more local high net investors who have started coming into the market. Because if you look at your investment opportunities out there, you've got your fixed deposits that are what, at about five and a half percent going, right? You've got your bond yields that are at historical lows. You look at anything else, you look at options that are out there for you, the equity market at this point of time is looking attractive. And it's very good to see that there are some newer sort of players who are coming into the market um, to sort of, you know, take take on the, the, the positions. And to me, I see that as a, as a positive at this point. Uh, Nikita. Yeah, hi. So the biggest thing that's driving the local investment is, uh, is the retailers. And the retailers are completely running out of options. Uh, this time last year, we had very safely double-digit FTs, uh, which, uh, which is really not the case anymore. So with the foreign investors capital flight and the local investors taking in, uh, the whole uh, investment psychology changes too. So um, the risk tolerance is higher. Uh, the level of um, dependence on macroeconomic strengths uh, to the market is also low, I would say, uh, because uh, you're really looking at, uh, the, on, on average, the local retailers have uh, shorter trading spans and uh, shorter holding time periods. So that's, that's what's really uh, pushing the market up. So, okay, uh, uh, quick question uh, from uh, somebody out there, you know, uh, is the earnings numbers that you are forecasting generally in the panel, uh, you think uh, reflected in market pricing right now? I mean, Sanjeeva, you said 40. Uh, can I switch to you, Sanjeeva? You said yeah. 40, 45, right? Uh, in your universe, right? Is that reflected yeah. in the market, you think? Uh, yes, I mean, uh, th these, th these downward divisions were done immediately after... Uh, uh, the management uh, of these companies uh, gave out their outlooks. But, uh, I mean, as we expect, it's a V-shaped recovery and uh, things are, uh, you know, you know, we, we saw, you know, big banks like Commercial Bank of Ceylon coming up with 6 billion uh, impairment uh, uh, write-offs uh, during the first quarter results itself, like, you know, just prior to COVID. So that, that's the highest quarterly impairment uh, for a listed bank uh, in the history. So, you know, we, we see these guys taking it head on. So technically, uh, I, I think uh, they're, they're, uh, they're at least on track to uh, you know, move, move ahead. Now, uh, we, we see uh, th there is potential for most of the stocks to re-rate. Uh, we'll discuss those later. Okay, Dimantra, uh, again, forecasting market-wide 23%, uh, you said. Do you think that's factored in, in the current pricing? Because, uh, because if you look at it like everywhere else, uh, how, uh, what the outlook for the economy doesn't seem to correlate to what's happening in the, in the equity market here. Uh, I feel the market is uh, ignoring uh, this year's earnings. We know that it's already down, and I think it's uh, already uh, factored in when what the uh, investors are at the moment uh, looking at is the uh, potential towards uh, next year. Now, uh, if we uh, look at it now, we are, we are of course uh, looking at a 22% uh, decline in earnings uh, this year. However, uh, though the market is on last year's earnings, trailing earnings are it's trading at around uh, 10 times to uh, 11 times if you take the overall market. But uh, we feel that it can uh, move up to around uh, 14 times PE, so yeah, basically earnings come down this year, but the market moves up on expectations of uh, next year and uh, with the uh, overall uh, uh, lower interest rate environment, the expectations of from the equity market also has come down, so uh, with that expectation. So uh, okay. what we are looking at for the index is that uh, we are looking at around uh, 5,400 
uh, for the index to a for a range we are looking at 52 to 56 it's a 10% uh, upgrade from the last time that i uh, told where we were looking at 46 to 49 uh, so it's mainly because of the improved uh, uh, conditions with the ec monetary policy that will benefit the earnings of the uh, companies so so that's essentially what you're forecasting the index will be around by year end right this year correct correct right uh, if you look at sort of listed stocks where do you think um, based on your outlook uh, the potential hasn't been priced in right now is there such a thing do you think uh, yeah so uh, the easy one to uh, look at i think is the uh, banking sector mm. uh, basically we feel we are very positive on the banks where most of the banks are trading at uh, 50% of their uh, book values and obviously ROEs have significantly come down. But then uh, in a recovery uh, cycle, we have estimated, uh, six, uh, we've put the bank banking sector into the uh, nine months to 12 months to 12 months category to uh, fully recover from this uh, current situation. So we feel that there'll be a significant improvement in ROEs uh, as we move on to uh, next year. So banking is uh, one of the key ones that we are looking at. And then uh, da telcos, uh, so dialogue uh, is one of our key stocks as well. We feel that uh, the one of the minimum uh, uh, low affected counters were uh, dialogue. However, uh, potentially next year there could be a bit, a bit of a run on the currency. Then you have to be uh, careful on the forex loss that they may uh, encounter because of the large uh, debt portfolio uh, that they hold. So, uh, and also uh, you have to have in mind that uh, the government that may uh, come in is uh, more uh, shifted towards uh, infrastructure uh, projects. So uh, we feel that uh, though uh, there is a lack of capital, uh, by uh, going for non-traditional uh, capital sources, they are likely to uh, find the capital and they definitely are likely to uh, move into uh, privatizations as well. So we are also looking at the access uh, due to with the construction uh, infrastructure run that would be there. Uh, Udishan, can you uh, weigh in on uh, where you think, uh, I mean, banking is an obvious one, right? Uh, half of book value, you won't find banks, I think, anywhere in the world at those prices, right? Uh, if you look a little beyond, where do you think uh, value lies? Where do you think uh, the buy opportunities are? Uh, so I think, I would think the FMCG and diversified sectors uh, have some potential in terms of uh, uh, bit of growth in terms of outlook because the, the, the ability for FMCG companies to bounce back is fairly uh, certain because these are essential things that they sell and, and uh, there's no, uh, even if earnings are lower, you will still consume at least the same amount of FMCG goods. So uh, I believe the FMCG companies could bounce back faster. Uh, and also in terms of diversified counters, there are uh, particular counters which have a bit of diversification on uh, sectors which are not impacted the most. Uh, sectors I would avoid are the discretionary uh, sectors where uh, there is more discretionary spending like consumer goods, uh, automobiles, uh, uh, residential construction are things that I would avoid. Uh, right. There will be certain sectors in the economy uh, in terms of even construction which because of the import duties uh, or the import controls which are in place right now. Uh, so some of the construction companies which uh, supply material Locally, we'll, we'll have a benefit uh, on that angle as well. Okay, can I ask you about uh, John Kills very quickly? We used to see, uh, the market used to suggest that John Kills is a bellwether for the Sri Lankan economy. And, and if you look at uh, its exposure as a group, you know, it's got exposure to, you know, consumer, very strong rebound expected, uh, port operations, etc. So exports to some degree, right? Um, uh, and also hotels and stuff like that, which are, which are likely to be hit pretty badly. Um, is it a bellwether and, uh, and, and what does that say about what we expect? Uh, it is a bellwether in terms of the economy because of that, the, the sectors that they're operating in. Uh, but in terms of earnings outlook, I don't think it will mirror the 
overall market in the next uh, one two years because of the investments which are going into cinema life right now so because they are eroding their financial income right now uh, with capex going in and given that a project like cinema life will take a long time to start generating bottom line you might see a longer period of time in terms of uh, jk can starting to recover in terms of bottom line uh, you might see the fmcg the port activities contributing to bottom line uh, but earnings wise it might take a longer period of time to see recover but it's it's a nature of the business as such uh, but uh, the share price might not move in line with the earnings uh, because it's more in anticipation of how uh, the success rate of cinema life will be and also keep in mind that market earnings are not a leading factor for for market movement right now uh, even that it's more of a liquidity driven rally more more than a earnings driven rally for the moment right okay uh, anybody wants to weigh in on uh, john kills and and cinema life uh, in particular big uh, you know it, I, i guess little un- unlucky on the timing see the, the fact that about 62% uh, of their total effective capital uh, is invested in um, in cinema life and in uh, in the hotels so they are particularly unlucky uh, in timing in this and this is these aren't two sectors that's going to turn turn around immediately so uh, what's doing pretty well for them in terms of their uh, capital employed would be uh, the CC, uh, ccs which you which you have an uh, which you have a door separately uh, if if that's what you want to invest in so again uh, the buzz around jkh is more for strategic reasons um, rather than for uh, cap, uh, for the capital adjusted earnings and anybody can take this one right if if a liquidity is a play right now right and and you you're trying to leverage this liquidity uh, liquidity opportunity in the, in the equity markets uh which businesses are best placed to do that right now uh it's a uh, yeah yeah so um yeah i mean as uh, sectors uh, to discuss uh, uh, telco is a given and uh, we prefer dialog given that uh, the main uh, matter that uh, kept the share price below 15 rupees was their external debt which we which they will pay out uh, during next 2.5 years so 18 million a quarter starting fourth quarter this year they will pay it off so technically the share price has to re-rate up above 15 rupees uh, after that um, and you know just uh, benefiting from covid also uh, their data volumes grew 30 to 40% uh, as they mentioned in a, in a zoom forum with you but uh, they expect that to sustain at least at 20% levels uh, uh, going forward even uh, post lockdowns uh, due to the uh, new demand that's that has come in so uh, uh, that that's uh, that's a area that uh, Uh, we think uh, will uh, have more investor attention uh, whereas they prefer to get rupee loans given low interest rates so that's one area banking any economic recovery will be reflected through banking so yes banking but yeah you have certain stocks like you know uh, commercial bank uh, there will be a overhang uh, till the private placement uh, is uh, over uh, because it won't go above 80 uh, till that's over and then um, uh, as as some of the panelists said uh, fmcg and pharma distribution so companies like hemas uh, will benefit uh, so that's also in our uh, buy list and then uh, tokyo cement uh, you know they have now um, uh, moved on to uh, locally manufactured cement that gives a 30% margin as opposed to imported cement giving 5 to 10% margins so they are also going to benefit uh, with uh, new projects coming in and then um in finally disti but this will be a short story uh, for disti because they are uh, uh, depending on imported uh, local al- uh, ethanol uh, for alcohol manufacturing but the point is that uh, there are now complaints coming in saying that the quality of their product uh, has some issues so uh, even though they are making some uh, better margins here uh, it will not be a long lived story
Is that your experience also, Sanjeev? Is that the quality uh, <laughs> issue? Uh, unfortunately, I have not tried the product right now. <laughs> uh, okay, you guys are all uh, bulls on banking, right? But uh, the the other sector that's uh, that's lending is the non-bank financial institutions. Is is I know you don't cover it, but uh, do you see that the narrative on non-bank financial institutions can be very different to what we are seeing in banking? Anybody wants to uh, go in on that? I'm sure that so we cover the NBFI sector, and um, I think some one thing that is there is that they are literally getting hit quite a bit in terms of the moratoriums. The fact that um, any of the vehicles that are not paying, they cannot uh, sort of retake those vehicles uh, during this period. So even those who didn't pay before the moratorium, now you cannot even touch their vehicles. So you know there are things like that. You've seen impairments go up significantly in our cover in the stocks that we cover as well. Um, but look, at the end of the day, the NBFI sector has been hit quite a bit with all the import controls, uh, the import taxes, also the duties that there were in the last couple of years. So on top of that, when it's a hard stop on importing vehicles, um, you know, you're looking at uh, quite a tough sort of time um, in, the, in the months to come for these guys. So for them, I think preserving their capital, uh, maintaining their core capital ratios will be one of the key sort of, um, you know, priorities for them at this point of time. What I think is that they will literally ride this wave, sort of make sure if, you know, to wade in on this low interest rate environment and sort of take whatever assistance the central bank has given them and sort of um, assist in whatever way in terms of their disbursements. Uh, but also to maintain that in main, maintaining their asset quality, because that I think is something that is really a concern um, in that sector. Uh, do you know the PFI <laughs> asset quality has deteriorated very significantly, right? Uh, already it's in double digits. Uh, uh, the uh, I have a point to add to that. Yeah, yeah uh, I agree with Lakshmi. And on top of the multiple hits uh, that she mentioned, I think the import restriction uh, that is there. Uh, leave it in the vehicles because bulk of these NBFIs uh, uh, lend money to for uh, as uh, leasing or as against uh, these vehicles. So that is another uh, major hit. So uh, NBFI I, I probably except for the uh, big three or four uh, names, uh, I think uh, probably that's an area that uh, you should probably uh, stay away because uh, you you are likely to have multiple hits over the next few three or four quarters on a continuous basis and capital uh, erosion is a likely uh, scenario and most of these uh, companies have do, do have a, a low capital base right so it's easy for maybe investors already not exposed to navigate away but for the rest of the economy if uh, if if there appears you know if a systemic problem starts appearing in the NBA, nba files you know that that's a huge thing in any anybody who's really concerned about nba files right now you know uh, uh, are we uh, because banks have so many there's so much liquidity banks have so much lending opportunity nba files are particularly badly placed yeah I think as the quarters go on, uh, there's a likelihood that uh, these NBFIs uh, can go into further uh, distress. So uh, uh, monitoring the uh, credit rating and the credit quality uh, uh, is, uh, I think, a priority at this moment of time, whether they have the required capital adequacy levels is, I think, a priority uh, at this moment of time. Over the next few quarters. Sure, I'll, I'll I ask. think that. Um, sorry, just to add to that, Shamil. I think what the central bank may do is they will actually sort of push for further consolidation. I think this was in the agenda for a long time, uh, but now the need has come much more than ever, right? So I think what they will do is really push. But again, then it's in the interest of the larger NBFIs on if they are actually willing to take up uh, these smaller guys who are in trouble. Um, at this point of time. Um, so, you know, it's either do, do the bigger guys take on the smaller guys or do the smaller guys collude and consolidate themselves. Um, I mean, we, we, we have discussed this quite a bit and uh, I think it is something which the central bank will really push to. Okay. Uh, one final question on this is, uh, you know, we, we haven't really talked about hotels. Uh, econ the, the economy is significantly exposed to the outcome in tourism, although necessarily the market isn't in the same way, but but that is, of course, uh, 
barring John Keels and Aitken Spence hotels, right, which are uh, two large listed stocks. Um, I don't know if your universe includes those, but uh, can we have a quick comment on what is the likely outcome, at least from a listed stocks perspective, on uh, on hotels, hotel stocks? Uh, who wants to take this, uh, Udishan? Uh, um, yeah, I can take it. Yeah. Go, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so we do cover some of the some of those stocks that you mentioned, and I think look, I think cash preservation, managing your cash flows is going to be the key concern for the hotels. Those who have exposure to the Maldives, I think, sit in a little bit of a better position than some of the others, uh, because Maldives has already opened up to some extent, um, and that may sort of ease things to a little bit. I, do, I don't think it will fully sort of compensate. Neither will the domestic traveling that you have seen pick up compensate for the lack of foreign tourists com coming in. So to us, what we see, Shamindra, is literally the tourism sector, the hotels, pretty much riding this wave. Anyone who can restructure some of their loans uh, at a lower rate, like any other company, uh, but specifically some of these guys, if they do sort of manage something like this, taking into advantage this low interest rate environment, I think that's something most of the companies should really concentrate on to make this, you know, make this as much as a positive as they can. Um, and it's literally riding this wave until the airports do open up and some normalcy comes in you know, sometime next year. But, but this is one area, I guess, there's real blood on the street, right? Uh, anybody in the panel want, has, has a comment? Yeah, basically, we are also actually it's, uh, significantly negative on the uh, hotel uh, sector. Actually, in our timeline, uh, we are looking it into the 12 months to 18 months uh, category uh, for looking for a recovery. Uh, so, uh, with this uh, COVID-19 and possible second wave, third waves uh, that are there all around the world with the travel restrictions that are there, we think it will take a uh, quite a while uh, until this sector uh, starts uh, recovering. Obviously, on a global standard, if you look at it, they may recover, uh, Sri Lankan hotels may recover slightly faster than the rest, uh, considering the track record so far that uh, we've uh, uh, managed to uh, restrict uh, the uh, positive patients. But uh, still, uh, if you look at the valuations, Valuations still are expensive. Prices have not really uh, come down. So all in all, uh, it's quite unattractive at this moment. Okay, so we'll go to closing thoughts from there. I'll uh, ask each of you to uh, take no more than two minutes. We're slightly over time, but uh, we have a large enough audience, so I kept it going. Um, uh, can I, again, start with you, Dimanta? Uh, Closing thoughts, uh, just wrap it up, wrap, wrap up any loose ends and uh, give us a theme if you want. Yeah. So uh, as I started off, uh, I think uh, we are uh, on a uh, basis that uh, the recovery process in Sri Lanka is going to be uh, W-shaped. Obviously, it's going to be a slightly upward trending uh, W-shaped because we are looking at a bit of a uh, currency shock and interest rates shock. Uh, towards the mid of next year. So that's where the possible uh, short-term uh, downward cycle can come in, but it's a upward uh, trajectory in terms of the uh, W uh, recovery uh, that we are looking at. Uh, and uh, in terms of the currency, we don't think uh, there could be too much depreciation this year. So we are looking at yeah, upgrading our expectations 185 to 190 for this year, but uh, we are looking at a bit of a heavy uh, depreciation uh, towards uh, next year. So, uh, yeah, that's the uh, okay. main thing I wanted. Right. Uh, Lakshi, uh, closing thoughts. Uh, look, Shamindra, I mean, like I mentioned, we are expecting a pretty big contraction in growth for this year. If you're looking at some of the subsectors and uh, how they're performing, um, what's positive is the low interest rates, right? I think companies need to sort of focus on any possible restructuring that can be done, um, utilize this time, you know, to sort of make whatever changes. Um, and also sort of in terms of investors as well, right? You're looking at beyond 2020. Um, and that's essentially what everyone is doing. Corporates are literally doing the same thing. Um, and in terms of what we expect on the fiscal side, we do expect quite a bit of strength. 
but key things we are looking at for this year is the election result as well as the 2021 budget. Now that to us, it will give us some good news and some good sort of indicators rather into what's going to come in in 21. And I think a lot of people are looking at this as well. Um, similar to the month, we don't expect uh, a very heavy depreciation for in the current support 2023, but we do expect it to reach about 195 at this point of time. Um, but like he also mentioned, I think next year we may see a bit more pressure with the, the import restrictions um, coming out. But there are pockets of opportunity. Um, I don't think it's all doom and gloom. Um, you know, there are opportunities that can be taken. You need to just look at it, look at what the exposure is. And these low risk in, in interest in our environment needs to be utilized much more. That's what I think. All right, so that's an opportunity. Uh, Nikita, uh, closing thoughts. So I believe the current uh, CSC investor base is more retail centric than we would have liked to. So that brings in uh, possibilities like I uh, really not expecting them to be completely prepared for the June numbers that they would see in the middle of August. So I see a contraction there and a slow uh, appreciation from that point onwards, depending on uh, how, for instance, uh, the banks uh, will report their uh, balance sheet figures uh, and, and uh, going forward from that direction. So we'll see how well uh, uh, the bank balance sheets have been preserved and how the other in, uh, industries, how badly the other industries have taken a hit. So I believe Sri Lanka would continue to protect uh, the currency. I think the imports will continue to be curtailed for, uh, for a little longer than we'd like. And that will probably be the one way of us uh, preserving currency to be able to uh, maintain, uh, uh, maintain our interest payments. And uh, also I believe Sri Lankans haven't factored in a default risk, but the foreigners may have. So once we have made uh, good on the October 2020 payments and the 2021 July payments, the foreigners probably would let go of some of their uh, insecurities, uh, some of their discounts and come back because the equity guys are in it for the longer term than the, than the forex guys. I'm not placing a lot of uh, stress on the rupee in the short term. I think uh, in uh, say in the next 18 months, it will be in the 190, 192 uh, era. And uh, yeah, not a lot of uh, stress on that. So I think uh, the foreigners in the, in, in the middle run uh, in, in the, uh, uh, a midterm should be okay. Thanks, uh, Nikita. We heard a very persistent lapwing, I think, uh, behind the scenes. Lapwing is a bird. Uh, oh. <laughs> oh, 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 domestic bliss. <laughs> okay, Udishan. Uh, no, sorry. I'll go to Sanjeeva uh, and then come to you, Udishan. Uh, Sanjeeva, go ahead. Uh, somehow we can't hear you. Can we? No, I can't hear you. Okay, we'll go to Dishan uh, and then come to you, Sanjeeva, right? Uh, yes, so as we discussed before, negative uh, GDP outlook, uh, recovery cycle starting from second half of next year, uh, interest rates remaining low until the end of the year, uh, comfortably paying this year's foreign reserves, uh, debt repayments through foreign reserves, but uh, exchange rate might remain comfortably at about 195 rupees to the dollar uh, because of the import controls, less money flowing out of the debt markets because there's not much of holdings left in foreign uh, uh, by foreigners. Uh, uh, next year might be, this, the scenario might be different in terms of exchange rate where we could look at uh, higher depreciation uh, once import controls are removed and once, if the liquidity is not absorbed from the system, you might see that flowing into imports, which might effectively uh, drag your rupee a little bit more. Uh, in terms of uh, markets, uh, markets might move in a different direction on might not move as similar to how the economy will move uh, move because of uh, the liquidity pumping in that is coming in uh, because there's excess money sitting there going into uh, there's no place to go into apart from uh, either your you can move into your low interest rate deposits which are now almost yielding negative interest rates or else you could move into real estate uh, 
uh, which is very likely at the moment given that real estate went through a bit of a bubble uh, during the last two to three years. But yes, there is a little bit of interest building on that, uh, which leaves us with, uh, with the equity market, which might see movement on retail and liquidity movements. Uh, and keep in mind that uh, if the market is about 7 trillion rupees, so even if 1% of that market flows into equities, you're looking at about 70 billion rupees equity flows uh, to the market. Uh, so equity markets might move, uh, not in congruence to, to how the economic fundamentals will be working. Awesome. So, so that's an emerging theme here, clearly. Uh, it's happening all over the place and uh, equity markets are not in congruence with uh, economic outlook. Sanjeev, is that true? What are your thoughts? Closing thoughts. Okay, I don't think we can still hear you, Sanjeev. Something seems to have gone wrong. No, no, not yet. Not yet. Uh, what about now? Okay, okay, let's go. Right. So, um, yeah, while there's blood on the street, um, I think it's, uh, uh, I mean, if you missed the bus uh, initially, uh, might as well uh, pick, pick up your stocks now. So technically, uh, you will have the country uh, repaying its debt uh, come October. And by next July also, there is just a 5% chance of defaulting. Uh, you will have a stable government. So technically, I think, pick your stocks because foreigners are not in for some given reasons. You know, you have similar uh, earnings multiples in stock markets like Singapore and Hong Kong. So they will also enter when it goes up to maybe 12 or 13 and uh, all the retailers can, you know, make a buck also by selling it to them. So uh, whether foreigners come on, come now or not, uh, they will come in. And uh, I, I think, uh, given all these interest rates, low interest rates, it's it's high time to uh, get your uh, feet into the equity market. All right. With that, uh, thank you, guys. I think that was a riveting chat. Uh, lots of ideas. Uh, some that stood out include, you know, okay, there's an anticipation that we will do hard reforms come, uh, you know, after the election. That will matter uh, significantly on whether we can get IMF support, uh, whether we can uh, potentially then sidestep uh, the risk of a debt default. Um, uh, and the capital markets continue to move in opposite direction to the economic outlook, which is pretty poor, uh, given that uh, the highest, best possible performance is from the month of a minus 1.4 and uh, going up to minus 4.5 for this year, right? So, so clearly, Sanjeev, you're saying, oh, uh, pile in and uh, we have potentially 4.5% economic contraction. We'll have a chat next year. <laughs> this is what's happening all over the place also, right? So, uh, so thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, that was uh, a fantastic chat. Thank you for your time and putting the effort in to get uh, be uh, pre prepared for this. Um, and uh, indeed, and thank you also for over 100 people who were on Zoom and uh, as many, I think, on Facebook Live. Uh, many more. We'll see this later on. Uh, so I think we had a great audience for a, for a weekday. And I tried to paraphrase as many of the questions that I was getting, uh, although I didn't always refer to them. Uh, so thank you very much for everybody who joined us live uh, and uh, I hope you got something out of it as, 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 uh, as, as I think our team, uh, our panel did quite outstandingly well. Thank you very much and uh, we'll join you hopefully soon in a, another echelon decodes. Thanks a lot guys. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Always a blast. Have a good day. Good Thanks day. guys. Bye. Okay. Bye guys. And the live stream is done. Well done, guys. Bravo. Guys. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye. Enjoy the rest of the day. Enjoy your weekend. Yeah, you too. Sanjeev, I am first hand experience in the quality of the. Is that true? Are we live or not? I don't know. This is all off the record. <laughs> and, uh, since you wanted me to do it very quickly. <laughs> <laughs>